living through a pandemic, how the Low Country moves forward. From Washington to the South Carolina State House to right here in the Low Country, the war against COVID-19 wages on. Now political, medical, and education leaders say we are continuing to fight this virus. I am uh, optimistic that um, by the end of the year, we will have a vaccine. The world of sports, even weather, rocked by the pandemic, still finding their way. And people in our area are finding hope, even during these difficult days. Tonight, News 2 presents Living Through a Pandemic, How the Low Country Moves Forward. Good evening and thank you for joining us for this special edition of News 2. I'm Carolyn Murray. It's good to have you here. I'm Brendan Clark. For months now, we've bring, been bringing you the daily case totals and death counts in the COVID-19 pandemic on a national, state, and local level. And while those facts are very important, tonight's show is really about perspective of what this pandemic has meant and will mean moving forward for the low country as a whole. And tonight we have team coverage from the entire News 2 team. Anchors Brad Franco and Sophia Desisor speaking with some of the top medical and education minds in the state and in our community. And here in the studio tonight, the Low Country's Chief Meteorologist Rob Fowler and Sports Director John Barron will describe the impact of the pandemic on people, how they function, as well as how they enjoy life. We also have the Charleston Mayor, John Tecklenburg, live in our studio, socially distanced, of course, to tell us how the Low Country is moving forward through COVID-19. We have a lot to get to, so let's start with the latest facts on the pandemic from one of the Medical University of South Carolina's top epidemiologists, Dr. Robert Ball. Brad Franco reports. Our concern is a lot of uh, young people going to bars and restaurants without wearing masks and crowding together and being in each other's faces shouting over the background noise and spewing virus. And, and the young people, you're saying, that they're the ones driving it? Primarily, but not only. What else, what's the other big driving factor then, besides that? Um, not so young people doing similarly, and then people who uh, are indoors who don't wear masks uh, and infect others. There's something about this virus that scares me. I've never been scared of any virus or pathogen until this one. I diagnosed South Carolina's first case of AIDS, didn't scare me a bit. And since then, Zika and other exotic diseases, no fear. This one scares the bejeebers out of me. Why? Because it's, on the biology of the virus, highly transmissible more so than we ever thought before. We know that it's transmissible by large respiratory droplets, hence the mask wearing is so critically important. But it may also be transmissible airborne, that is, if you cough or shout or sing in a choir, that's been well documented, then you are spewing virus way beyond uh, your six feet. And in fact, there are some studies that show that micro droplets, microscopic droplets, can go 15 to 20 feet in a closed room, average size closed room, that uh, has poor ventilation. Hence, the ventilation is more important, something the schools are going to have to seriously work on. Well, you brought up the schools because that is top of mind right now. So can we send our kids to school? Should we? <laughs> Sending kids to school is a very complex issue that uh, the educators and government leaders are going to have to address uh, more in detail, including social distancing, the mandatory wearing of masks, even indoors, especially indoors, hand washing, and ventilation. They may have to improve the ventilation systems with high efficiency filters that will uh, trap most particles. Would you send your kids? Thank goodness my kids have <laughs> grown and gone, but I worry about my grandchildren. And yes, uh, I'm, I would probably send them as long as all of those restrictions were in place. And their parents feel identically. Um, my son has asked me numerous times, should we send them? And uh, the answer 
uh, is it's complex. Yeah. It's not a simple yes or no. Correct. How encouraged are you by the, the newest vaccine information that uh, came out yesterday? Um, I am uh, optimistic that um, by the end of the year, we will have a vaccine that can be uh, put into late phase three trials on thousands of people. And let's see what kind of immunity develops. And we are also talking to local leaders about how they are handling this pandemic, the measures taken so far, what they are thinking about for the future in this new normal. We're speaking with City of Charleston Mayor John Tecklenburg now about the issues facing the city and really the low country as a whole. Mayor Tecklenburg, gracious enough to join us right now. We certainly appreciate this. And Mayor, I talked to you a little over a month ago and we really thought we were on the back side of this thing right now, but now we're not. In zip codes that make up downtown Charleston, more than 3% of residents have tested positive for COVID-19. may not seem like a big number, 3%, but it really is. That's a big number. How difficult is it for you to see that we are a hot spot when it comes to COVID-19? Well, it's, it's very disappointing and sad. You're right, a c couple of months ago, even uh, six weeks ago, we thought we were in a pretty good spot. Sure. But when we reopened up, we, we talked about a new normal, mm -hmm. but we, we really just went back to doing business as normal and going out and, as Dr. Ball said, folks going to bars and restaurants and beaches and gathering and uh, without masks on. And, and that's not the new normal. So uh, I'm very uh, pleased to hear him say that he's confident we'll have a vaccine uh, by the end of the year. And I know they're testing one already. So until there's a vaccine in place, uh, all our citizens, everyone, we really need to uh, follow these measures. Mm -hmm. I try to make it simple. I call it the three W's. Mm -hmm. W for wear a mask, uh, W for watch your distance, and a W for wash your hands. We, we, we've seen you walk around downtown King Street trying to raise awareness. You're handing out masks to people. That's right. But we've also been downtown. We see long lines at bars and restaurants. We see people not doing what we hope they should be doing. How is this going to end when people just aren't respecting these guidelines? Well, at City Council this week, we did pass a, a more uh, strict ordinance mm -hmm. about wearing masks. They're required everywhere now in the city of Charleston. We have uh, increased penalties, and uh, we've been educating folks up to now, but we're going to start um, having to write some tickets because we need to change some behavior, folks, and get to this new normal. Otherwise, we're going to um, uh, tax the... the um, the healthcare system, they'll be overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. We won't be going, our kids won't be going back to school. You know, Charleston School District, they were originally planning for mid-August, um, and now they're into September. If the numbers keep up, we, we, we won't even get our kids back to school on time. So it's so important. You talked about the hospital systems. Of course, we have the Medical University of South Carolina, MUSC, of Roper downtown, some major health systems downtown. Have you talked to them? What are they saying they need from you, anything? So their numbers have doubled sure. in the last couple of weeks, uh, Ropers particularly, and uh, they're getting to the point, they, they're at a challenge level, they're not quite overwhelmed, but if these numbers continue for a few more weeks, uh, they will be. So there will be pressure on supplies, but more importantly on, on medical personnel. And, and God bless our medical care professionals, nurses, doctors, everyone that's working in the healthcare profession that's attending to this. They are really heroes and I'm so thankful for them. So um, they're gonna be needing extra nurses uh, to the extent uh, we've been able to connect them with CDC and DHEC. They had some of those connections, of course, already, um, but we're trying to get supplies to them as, as these numbers continue to increase. So many businesses and business owners in downtown Charleston, what are those business owners saying to you about this? I mean, there's definitely just a double-edged sword here. They need to make the money, but they need to be safe, half capacity. There's so many different uh, things to think about when it comes to this. Right. So it's, it's just been a double whammy on businesses having to shut down earlier this year and then reopening and, and uh, the numbers aren't there yet for them. And now the numbers of COVID cases are rising. So the last thing we want to do is close businesses again. I think everybody agrees on that. But we may be forced to right. if these numbers continue to rise. And that's why I sound like a broken record. But if people, when they go out in public and they're uh, uh, close to other folks, you really need to be wearing a mask. All right. 
Charleston Mayor John Tecklenburg, thank you very much for joining us. We'll hear from the mayor coming up a little later in the show. Carol Murray will talk to him about other subjects important to us here in Charleston and the Low Country. Meanwhile, we are talking about Housing and Urban Development Secretary Dr. Ben Carson prepared for a forum on expanding access to capital and minority and underserved communities in the low country. Dr. Carson spoke about the housing burdens many are facing due to the pandemic from Washington, D.C. With people laid off or furloughed, many are finding themselves unable to pay rent or utilities and even facing eviction. He says those evictions can be prevented if renters, Public housing authorities and landlords utilize his department's resources. For the PHAs and the landlords in terms of forbearance, uh, for the renters to recognize that there are things available like uh, rent recertification. If your rent is based on your income uh, and your income drops dramatically or your job has that vapor, you can be certified so that you know, the government then is able to pick up that portion. But if you don't know about it, <laughs> obviously it's not going to happen. And we have more information about eviction moratoriums, resources for you online. Our website is countonto.com. Next on News 2. Well, 2020 hasn't pulled any punches with an expected active hurricane season peaking soon. Storm Team 2 has a look at how to manage both weather and COVID-related anxiety. And later on, we'll be talking more about how the virus has impacted the sports world. All those details from your News 2 sports team. Welcome back. This year has been difficult for all of us, and it's not yet over, especially in regards to hurricane season. It's important that we all continue to monitor our mental health. Meteorologist David Dixon spoke to experts about COVID and weather-related anxiety. Anxiety, uncertainty, frustration have become a part of our daily lives. And if a pandemic hasn't been enough to test our mental health, the peak of an active hurricane season is just around the corner. From what we know about psychological stress and trauma is that the effects of these things can be cumulative. The body keeps score, the psyche remembers. So if there's a, a history, a cumulative history of traumatic events that the person's lived through, and for all of us right now, we're getting a big kind of dose of that with COVID, um, come storm season, that extra layer of uh, potential stress uh, could result in really challenging times for people's mental health. An estimated 40 million Americans suffer from anxiety disorders, stemming from the body's natural response to stress, of which we certainly have seen a lot of this year. For some, the weather is the source of that anxiety. Sudden loud thunder, strong winds, and imposing dark clouds can be frightening. And it could be up to about 10% of uh, the population in the U.S. has some significant storm-related fear. Stewart says a dramatic experience with a storm early on in life often leads to a lifelong focus on the forecast, especially during hurricane season. This is a double-edged sword as those who pay more attention to the forecast will generally be better prepared. But when it gets down to such a micro focus on information uh, as a way to control those feelings, that's a sign that it's too much, spending too much time worrying. And of course, other things that we realize that go with a more generalized anxiety response. This hyper focus of information ties to COVID as well as focusing on statistics can send one tumbling down an emotional rabbit hole. The similarities between COVID-related anxiety and weather-related anxiety don't stop there, as David Diana with the Charleston Dorchester Mental Health Center explains. It's interesting how both the pandemic and we're talking about hurricanes, pandemics, and other natural disasters, it's all related uh, at the core to this issue of control and uh, our lack of it. Both Stewart and Diana urge us to take a look at what is out of our control and to manage what we can. Create a hurricane kit with your family, stay informed, and know your plan to give yourself and your family some peace of mind. If you do need more help, be sure to reach out, as we'll get through hurricane season the same way we get through everything else this year, together. David Dixon, Count on Two. And the South Carolina Department of Mental Health and the South Carolina Drug and Alcohol Commission have formed a mental health support hotline to help those who may be struggling. That number is 1-844-SC-HOPES. Next on News 2. Health experts around the country are recommending people wear masks, but which mask is best for you and your family? We speak with experts to get you the answers. 
Many of us are wearing many different styled masks, but which one is best? News 2's Danielle Hensley spoke with a medical expert to find out. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention recommend cloth masks to save medical grade masks for health care. But experts say anything is better than nothing. A cloth face mask and blue surgical mask do the same thing, according to Dr. Melissa Ellis Yerian with Roper St. Francis. These do the same thing. The point of a surgical face mask or a cloth face mask is to contain your own respiratory droplets. The masks do not block the tiny particles that you could inhale with the coronavirus, but they do protect those around you. The way universal masking works, the key to that is the word universal. Everyone has to wear it in order for it to work because that means everyone's containing their own respiratory droplets and not infecting each other. An N95 non-medical mask is commonly used for industrial purposes and does keep you from breathing in tiny respiratory particles. So if you're wearing this, it's fine, but you need to cover this little, this valve, <laughs> this vent here with either some tape or some cloth because otherwise, while you're protecting yourself with what you're breathing in, you're exhaling your respiratory droplets and that would defeat the purpose of universal masking. A cloth face mask should have two layers according to CDC guidelines and be washed on a regular basis. A mask should fit snugly but comfortably and cover the nose and mouth with no gaping under the chin or on the sides. In Charleston, Danielle Hensley, Count on Two. Next on News 2. Tonight, we are speaking with the mayor of the city of Charleston, John Tecklenburg. Mayor Tecklenburg is live in our studio right now. We are continuing our conversation with him, talking about what the city of Charleston is doing to make sure that you and your family are safe. That conversation right after the break. Living through a pandemic, how the low country moves forward. So what we need to do Take every step at our disposal to see to it that our children get back in their classrooms. Not only has this virus not gone away, it is growing precipitously in the low country. And if we think about an average of three contacts per case, that leaves us with having to interview approximately 4,000 people every single day. And you're looking at the spike in numbers, it keeps on going up and up and up. We're all saying that we've got to do more or we're going to have this area shut down. So um, we decided that we were all going to take steps. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for staying with us for our special report, Living Through a Pandemic, How the Low Country Moves Forward. We have had a lot of good information, and we have a lot more to come. As we are just weeks before school is scheduled to start, still lots of questions for parents and teachers. What will school look like, and will families and teachers be kept safe? News 2's Sophia DeSasor took those questions and more to the state capitol, a one-on-one -on -one conversation with State Superintendent Molly Spearman. President Trump, education head Betsy DeVos, and most recently Governor Henry McMaster all pushing to return to the classroom. This as low country counties continue to fall short of state standards recommended before returning to in-person classes. I sat down with State Superintendent Molly Spearman who says parents and students need options and the choice should be theirs. Well, there's no doubt that children thrive best if they are face to face with a teacher in a very safe and comfortable environment. So that is my goal. Uh, I also have as a standard and realize that with the pandemic, this option should be left up to parents and they do need options. So while face to face is very important and we want to offer a face to face experience for every family, it's also important that we offer a virtual experience. And we've spoken a lot about that virtual option, which um, a lot of families already went through at the end of this past school year. Uh, we do know that some students have struggled with that option, yeah. and we do know that there are some 10,000 students who were kind of lost in that. What is the plan to re-engage with those students, especially if this program is going to continue on into the next year? I think in Mar on March 16th, we went into emergency instruction, and the virtual program that you saw 
was we did the best we could. Some districts were better pa prepared than others, but no one envisioned or was prepared for weeks and weeks and weeks of virtual instruction. So the virtual instruction that you will see starting in August or September is going to be much higher quality, much higher expectations from students. So it will be different. It will be better. And students will have a responsibility to be very engaged uh, on their attendance, on the work that they turn in. So uh, while, again, I don't want to say anything against what school districts did back in March because it was overnight transformation and I applaud them for what they were able to accomplish. But this virtual that will be beginning will be much higher expectation. Do you wish the governor was taking a harder stance in putting regulations in place now so that we could be in a better place later? Each citizen of South Carolina plays a, plays a part in whether or not how normal we will be able to go back to school. So it is a personal responsibility. Uh, that's hard to legislate. That's hard to uh, say in order. But folks need to put on masks, and especially our teenagers and college-age students need to get out and really be a part of this and help protect us so that we can go back to school, we can have normal activities, high school football games, college games, all the things that we look so forward to in the fall. But it's all of us working together to make that happen. Is there anything you wish our leaders were doing differently during this time? Uh, I was concerned when I heard folks in Washington started talking about how schools should be operated in Charleston, South Carolina or Dorchester or Somerville. Uh, I don't believe that directive needs to come from Washington, D.C. and really not even from Columbia. That needs to be decided in the local community where it's best, where folks know the spread, they know the needs of the community, and that is a local decision. Uh, I still believe strongly that all parents should have an option. They should not be forced to say that their children have to go back to school five days a week. We have to offer them a virtual option. Districts need to release their plans 20 days before the first day of school after approval by the Department of Education on Wednesday. The governor said he directed Spearman to deny any plan that does not include an in-person option and that he wants those plans submitted by tomorrow. Reporting in studio, Sophia Desasor. Count on two. Sophia, thank you. Government leaders are also working hard to help people adjust to the new normal and find the best ways to keep our economy open while trying to lower transmission rates. We continue our discussion right now with the mayor of the city of Charleston, John Tecklenburg, about what city government is doing right now. Mayor, thank you so much for being with us and for staying with us to help us better understand what you're doing in the city of Charleston to keep people safe. One thing that happened today was today was a day of prayer in the city of Charleston. You were asking people to be in prayer and to at least remember more than a thousand lives that have been lost as a result of this pandemic in South Carolina. That's right, Carolyn, and, and it's so sad, the loss of life. And for months now, we've been watching these numbers build on a screen. But when you think about over a thousand deaths now in our home state of South Carolina and Charleston County now leading the state in the number of active cases of coronavirus, it, it's sad. And we do ask God for his, his grace and his guidance going forward, his blessings to all those health care workers who are caring for those who are sick um, and a path forward, how to move forward. And so there is a new normal now that we have to realize until there's a real cure or a vaccine, we've got to protect ourselves from one another and care for one another. And you do that by wearing a mask and watching your distance and washing your hands, good hygiene. Everybody's been preaching it. We need yeah, everybody to Yeah, you described to those as the three W's. That's right. Wearing a mask, washing your hands, and watching your distance. That distance, of course, being six feet. Mayor, you touch on the fact that more than 1,000 deaths in South Carolina. Disproportionately, those who have died have been people of color, uh, right. with the low country being 30% African American, but 50% of those who've died, what are you doing to affect those underserved and those communities? So this virus, when it attacks your body, it looks for the weakest point. And so if you have some underlying health condition, um, it'll go for it. And uh, so 
So this indicates the health disparities that exist between whites and African Americans in terms of diabetes and all these other health issues. And so proportionately, um, this is the net result. What are you doing to, to try to help those communities? I know that one thing you said was try to make sure that those testing sites are in locations where people can get to them. So, for example, this coming Monday, the city of Charleston is sponsoring a testing at our Julian Devine Center mm -hmm. over on the east side, and people can sign up. Uh, but I also uh, would advise folks to look at the DHEC website because they list all of the testing sites. We've been trying to go to underserved communities, working with Medical University, the Shifa Clinic here in Mount mm -hmm. Pleasant and others in order to provide testing just so people will know uh, that they need treatment and they need care. Sometimes you'll be carrying this virus and you won't even know it. Right. Lots of people are asymptomatic. There is also a clinic that's going to happen July 25th at my beloved Burke High School in downtown Charleston. So hopefully people will be able to get to that. Mayor, right. you know, when you've talked about the three W's and that it's very important that people wash their hands, watch their distance, as well as wear a mask. That's really difficult to do in a community where people enjoy eating out. So how are you supporting restaurants? I know one thing you've done is you have, in fact, uh, changed the hours where people have to pay for parking right. to try to make sure that people are able to be in downtown Charleston but still practice those things that will keep them safe. That's right. So, for example, when we ended our um, stay-at-home period and the businesses were opening back up, we used to charge for parking up until as late as 10 o'clock at night. We cut that back to 6 o'clock. We offered parking spaces for uh, businesses, for restaurants to have uh, free pickup and to, uh, for customers that want to pick up. And we've relaxed our regulations about sidewalk dining and allowing outdoor spaces. So like right now, we're, we're, we're having to really be careful because restaurants and bars are the places where people gather and just by the nature of the business, it's where they take their mask off right. to eat and drink. And so uh, the virus has been spreading, and so we need to keep occupancy levels low to dine outside as possible. And just whenever you're not eating and drinking in that act, to please wear your mask. I can't say it enough. You can't say it enough. We appreciate your time. Charleston Mayor John Tecklenburg yeah. for spending some time with us this evening. And remember the three W's, wear your mask, wash your hands, and watch your distance. Mayor, thank you again. Thank you, Carol. And Mount Pleasant Shop is beating the odds by finding ways to build business during this pandemic. News 2's Kate Prestak spoke with one of the owners about this unlikely success. On March 26th, co-owner Ebony Mullins landed here in Charleston from San Diego. And on March 27th, she opened their doors and they've been declared an essential business ever since. Owning and operating a small business during the coronavirus pandemic has been said to be more than a difficult task. I just opened the doors for 11 hours a day and it was it was scary at first, you know, because we didn't know what was going on. But opening a small business at the beginning of the pandemic and staying open is what some would say is a miracle. It was the very beginning of what was happening, but then you started building a community. People were stopping in and just wanting to have a conversation. Being in an alcohol and food beverage category, Mullins explained they were able to do a lot of takeout and to-go services. But for those that were able to come in, they were given an education to expand their palates. We cater to the small um, wineries and vineyards across the world um, and bring them in that people just haven't had the experience. You know, there's more than four varietals in the world, right? And a lot of people have come in in the very beginning and I've seen them progress to different kinds of taste. Right now, the shop is closed for a redesign, this being to better their space and become more friendly to social distancing protocols. But Mullen says they should be back in no time. It should be in the next three weeks. We are planning also doing um, a pop-up um, wine tastings and stuff so that people don't miss um, the fact that that's what we've been doing. To find out when Leah's Old Village Wine Shop will have a pop-up during their closure or when food trucks will be in the area, you can find that on our website. That's CountOn2.com. In Mount Pleasant, I'm Kate Prestak, CountOn2. We all know hospitals are working to find creative ways to get more people treated and tested during this pandemic. So MUSC looked at some unusual sources for inspiration. News 2's Antonio Stinson has more on the story. 
MUSC has a drive-in COVID-19 testing site in the parking lot of the Old Citadel Mall, and they say that the creation of the site was inspired by an unlikely pair. The MUSC drive-in COVID-19 testing site is the first of its kind on the East Coast, and the process is relatively simple. You would go through our virtual urgent care where you get your initial screening. It's a series of questions. And if through that process it's determined that you have to uh, get a specimen collected to see if you're COVID positive, we would actually funnel you through our drive through The site now services around 500 patients a day, and Dr. Crawford says that the site can owe its efficiency to a popular fast food chain. Chick-fil-A, I mean, they have the regular drive through just like any other drive through You're going to pull up. Somebody through the speaker is going to ask you what you want, then you're going to go to one window, you're going to pay, then you're going to go to the next window, and you're going to get your food. But when you overwhelm that process, what's your default process? Well, guess what they do? They put somebody outside. So as soon as you go in, I already have the information of what you want. And you're not even going to make it to the window. It was also inspired by one of America's most popular sports leagues. If you see a NASCAR pit crew and how they're able to safely and efficiently get their car what it needs so they can travel up to 200 miles per hour. That absolutely is the inspiration. So if somebody's not feeling well, the last thing we want to do is to keep them in their car for hours and hours and hours. They couldn't do it all by themselves as MUSC partnered up with Clemson to extend their reach beyond the low country. So if you think about what Clemson would help us do is to cover um, a broader area of the state as we do our specimen collections, uh, they're just a wonderful partner and hopefully, hopefully helping us flatten the curve. Dr. Crawford told me that he hopes MUSC will be able to expand their sites to other parts of the low country and in South Carolina. Reporting from Goose Creek, Antonio Stinson, Count on Two. Next on News 2. From canceled practices to altered schedules, the world of sports looks different in this pandemic. We'll take a look into the changed world of sports when we come back. This virus, the coronavirus, has impacted every aspect of our lives, and that certainly includes sports. News 2 Sports Director John Barron joins me now live to talk more about the impact on the sports world. And John, the latest news coming out today, South Carolina State and the MEAC, their conference, they play in, will not do fall sports at all. So no football for South Carolina State. Really is crunch time for conferences to make this type of decision, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. That makes three now. Okay? Yeah. We're talking about, you know, the, the way that everything's kind of going at this point, you know, we don't know exactly which direction it's going to go. But when it comes to college football, unfortunately, it, we're, you know, in between a lot of stuff. So sure. when it comes to that, that makes three conferences right now, all FCS. We don't know what the FBS is going to do at this point. But really right now, that might be unfortunately a sign of things to come. Yeah, maybe not a lot of fans in the stands, even if they do play football in the major conferences. When we talk about high school sports, John, uh, we do know they're pushing things back. But th I don't know if that's being optimistic or pessimistic that they're actually going to play high school football. Yeah, unfortunately right now they're pushing it back, but you know what, that might be a good thing because they haven't canceled the fall sure. sports, but at this point they're just pushing it back because that's probably a good thing for these, you know, these schools to be able to have these guys stay and play some football before going and you know, having a mix when it comes to spring because you have a lot of those guys doing that. But of course, like we said, you spoke with MUSC's Lanier Jackson who recently put together recommendations for athletes returning to play after getting COVID-19. So we do have an algorithm that we put together that's available for all healthcare providers. Um, it guides you through patients that are asymptomatic, that are COVID positive, and patients that have moderate symptoms and patients with severe symptoms. And it's a different algorithm or a different pathway for each of those patient populations. Asymptomatic patients are patients with mild symptoms, and that's the fever for only a couple of days. And once you get out of a two week period of your COVID positive test, that you could return to sports. X group is uh, patients with moderate symptoms as well and that's where it gets broken down for less than 12 years of age and older and it's kind of more lenient for those that are less than 12 because we know that when you're playing sports at that level it's kind of similar to what you're doing with active play on the playgrounds. There's not much difference in playing sports at that age and then patients that are older than 12 years of age and an EKG ends up being an important part of that screening evaluation to see if you're okay to go back to sports. And then the last group is the patients with severe symptoms, and that includes the multi-system inflammatory process that we've been talking a lot about, a lot about that you see in the news. You're going to be limited from sports for three to six months. Do you think that there's any concern with once they get back, because usually you have such a revving up period that these athletes are ready when the game's happening, that that could lead to something like maybe more injuries or just like, you know, guys not being ready because the timetables are all screwed up. 
Yes, 100%. I think that's why you see some of the professional level athletes that are say, saying they're going to take this season off because they're concerned they're not going to be able to train appropriately, that their body's not conditioned for it. I mean, obviously, that's not the exact same as a high school athlete or a middle school athlete, but there there is some some similarities there. It feels like the players want to play more than anybody else, and they're the ones putting themselves at risk the most, you know? Yeah, I mean, that, that actually, that last sentence you said is a very important thing. It's the athlete that's going to be the highest risk in that situation. Um, yes, I think that that is something that's driving this whole this whole situation. But once again, and I can understand, I'm sure when I was 18 that I would say, let me play over all else. Uh, but that's what your parents are there for. That's what a healthcare provider is there for to help provide guardrails as well. But I think an important thing to also say is that an asymptomatic person that is COVID negative is different than somebody with symptoms and a COVID positive test. That's your look at sports. Now let's head over to Rob in the Weather Center. Next on News 2. All right, thanks a lot, John. The hurricane season will require a little extra planning with the pandemic in the low country. Storm Team 2 shows you how shelters are preparing to take in people safely should a storm strike. That's next. The peak of the 2020 hurricane season still just under two months away, and the forecast of an above average season before it's all said and done is weighing heavy on all of us, on top of everything else we are dealing with right now. One potential issue is where and how to shelter our residents if we are threatened this year. It's a question that you might imagine is getting a lot of attention. Here in the low country, we are no stranger to tropical weather. With an already active Atlantic hurricane season underway, COVID-19 poses even more challenges in preparing for the potential of a natural disaster than ever before. It's a challenge that we are all facing together and one that community and state leaders are ready to tackle head on. We must be ready for these hurricanes because if we've seen them before, we are highly experienced in our coordination, collaboration, and communication amongst all of the various capacities in the state. But uh, there's a lot of challenges coming at one time. One of the biggest obstacles is planning out how to operate emergency shelters while still following CDC guidelines and following the appropriate social distancing. While people seek shelter, it is of the utmost importance that their health is not sacrificed in doing so. The American Red Cross is prepared to do just that, and they need all hands on deck to make it happen. We have certain measures in place. Um, extra hand washing stations that are going to be placed in shelters. We're setting up things a little differently. Of course, our mission and our work remains the same, but the way we're doing it is a little bit differently. Whether you decide to volunteer your time for your community or focus on keeping your own family safe and healthy, preparation is key, much as it is any hurricane season. We're asking every year, but now so more than ever, to really take preparedness seriously. Prepare yourselves. Prepare your family, prepare your home, be ready when and if the time comes. When packing your emergency kit, keep in mind the extra essentials you will need, such as face masks, hand sanitizer, and any other cleaning and health supplies. Whether it be COVID or hurricane or both, we all need to prepare together to stay low country strong. Stay with us. We have more news, too, coming up after this break. Before we leave you tonight, a retired nurse found painting as a way to stay positive during this pandemic. Martha Rogers found inspiration in her own backyard. She is finding peace and beauty and art and nature. Her time in quarantine sparked an idea, a series of paintings to inspire what she calls hope in a pandemic. She turned the paintings into an art show from a distance centered around the magnolia tree in her front yard. Neighbors she had never even met before are admiring her art and asking about her next show. Certainly a great story to end this show on, finding positivity during a pandemic. It is most certainly possible, and we saw great proof of it. We certainly appreciate you spending time with us tonight. Thanks for watching our special. We have more news tonight at 10 o'clock on The CW than on News 2 at 11. We hope to see you back. Have a great night.